Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Tonight, we'll be discussing polymyalgia rheumatica. As you know, we have a new campaign this month called Make Room for PMR. It's all about PMR all month. We have a lot of exciting uh, written articles and blogs, a lot of videos being done, even podcasts. And we're going to do every Tuesday night a TNR like this devoted to a particular aspect of polymyalgia rheumatica. I want to uh, take a moment and thank our sponsor this month, uh, Sanofi, who has not had any input into the content we choose or report on, and we thank them for this support. Um, tonight, we'll be discussing the diagnosis and monitoring of PMR. I think it's a topic that you all are interested based on your responses to our survey that went out yesterday. But before we get into some of those survey results, I want to uh, uh, announce uh, introduce our panel uh, and ask them to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Claire Owen. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, so I'm Dr. Claire Owen, and uh, I'm a rheumatologist uh, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I work at the Austin Hospital. Very good. Confuses me. I keep thinking she's in Texas with me in Austin, Texas, but no, she's on the other side of the world. Anisha, you're on mute. Hi, I'm back. Uh, I'm Anisha Dua. I am a rheumatologist at Northwestern University in Chicago um, and run the vasculitis program here. I'm happy to talk to you all today about PMR. And Stephen. My name is Stephen Padgett. I'm at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, and I'm honored to be with you, Jack. Okay. It's great to have such a great panel of people who really are interested in PMR and, um, and have been teaching all of us so much over the years. So we're going to get into what you think um, about diagnosis and monitoring. I'm going to start by sharing the results of the survey that was sent out yesterday uh, and that we quickly, as you can see, um, achieved 355 responses in uh, roughly 24 hours. That came from 59 countries. Um, with almost 60% of that being from the United States. Uh, I believe we asked a total of eight questions that we'll review for you today. We did get about 5% of the answers coming from uh, non-rheumatologists, which based on the way we send out our invites means that comes from nurse practitioners and physician assistants making up that. And it turns out their responses were pretty much on par with the adults. I'm also going to say, when I look at the data and give it a quick uh, overview as I did this afternoon. I also look at the responses between the whole world and just the U.S. to see if there is a significant difference. And when there is, I would report um, differently. It turns out there really weren't for any of these uh, questions. So I'm only going to present composite answers on the uh, from 355 rheumatologists. So the first question was, I think, the thorny question um, I, I wanted to get something that was pithy that would get people's juices going. And that is, can you make a diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica if the SED rate is less than 50? Uh, and as I get into this, I want to ask our audience to please ask questions uh, and, and we will answer them throughout this hour's webinar. Um, and you can you know, direct them to all of us or to someone specifically, but use the Q&A box to, and we already have one question in there, but use the Q&A box for your questions. So when you ask this first question about, can you make a diagnosis with a low SED rate? 70% of you said yes. And 27% said um, rarely. And, uh, and I would say, no, you can't. Um, but I think I'm gonna be in the wrong here. Um, uh, Anisha, I know you recently lectured on this. Do you think that that's true? You can you can make a diagnosis of PMR if the SED rate is less than 50? Yeah, I think you can. I think that there are other variables that go into play. And we know that the SED rate is not a perfect marker at all for this disease or many of the others that we try to use it for as a biomarker. Um, so yeah, I think that you can make a diagnosis of PMR if the SED rate is less than 50. But what if I had made this more stringent and said, if the patient's less than 50 in years of age and the SED rate's less than 50? And I thought about that but I wanted to see, I wanted to be a little more lenient on this. Um, would your answer be the same? 
it would be harder because uh, I mean, if we're going by like classification criteria, which is not used to make a diagnosis, but if we're looking at the classification criteria, that's part of it, right? Being 50 and older. So 50 is right at that cusp. Uh, I, you know, it doesn't talk at all about C-reactive protein or some of the other clinical variables. So I still think it's possible, um, but putting them less than 50 or right at 50 would make it, you know, a sliver for, yes, you still could, but I still think you could. So amongst the, the three of you, how many patients have you diagnosed with PMR under 50 with a SED rate less than 50? And I guess you could have another acute phase reactant elevated. The SED rate was, you know, 43, but the CRP was, you know, significantly elevated. Um, but just those two parameters, SED rate less than 50, age less than 50, have you made that diagnosis? Claire? Uh -huh. I'll, I'll jump in there. Yeah. Um, my answer would be yes, uh, I have, um, but it would always be with supportive imaging uh, findings. So um, it's, it's good timing because, in fact, we're presenting some work at the upcoming ACR on atypical uh, presentations of PMR and looking at their PET CT findings in this group. Uh, so I have seen a few patients, not many, uh, who have had uh, inflammatory markers that have been effectively normal and give a very good story uh, for PMR. And then we scan them on the, on the PET. Uh, and on PET-CT, basically, the answer is that we see the same uh, sort of characteristic findings, but they tend not to have the same degree of PET avidity that we would see uh, with patients with higher inflammatory markers. So Steve, you, you, in running the program for many, many years at special surgery, surely this issue has come up many times. What's been your sage advice to your trainees? With regard to the way this question is stated, uh, yes, of course, it's a syndrome. It has clinical manifestations. It has thrombocytosis. It has anemia. It has an elevated SED rate with proximal soreness and stiffness. That's PMR, just as it was in 1966, when Plotz and others uh, made this diagnosis and gave us the illness that we're dealing with. Less than 50, or much less than 50, really is a problem for me. So the both of those would be a problem. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's, I think, I guess, the, I was going to ask each of you, I, I guess I forgot to do this at the outset. I'm going to ask each of you to maybe start with an opening statement as to what is what is the one thing that concerns you regarding either diagnosis and monitoring when talking about PMR. Steve, do you have an answer to that? Um, I, I think again, I, I place a lot of pieces of information into my final decision as to how somebody's doing. One is function. Two is symptoms. Three is overall ability to carry out their activities of daily living. And I add the laboratory tests to it. If there's a discrepancy between those two, I have to figure out why that is. Do they have an infection? Do they have COVID? Is there something else going on superimposed on this, such as a neoplasm? So you're always asking questions as a clinician. Hmm. Claire, what do you, what's the one concern you have about diagnosis and monitoring of PMR? <laughs> Yeah, look, there's, there's plenty. Um, I think for me, uh, if we focus on diagnosis, uh, the main issue that I still have is that if you are relying on a clinical diagnosis, you are always going to misclassify patients. You're going to include patients that probably don't have true PMR. Uh, and we, if we're not using imaging, the issue as well is that we're probably missing that uh, concomitant uh, giant cell arteritis population too. So are, you would then be a proponent for the frequent use of imaging so as, a, so as to avoid misclassification? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I understand that uh, I, I'm certainly not advocating for the use of uh, the types of imaging that we use in research uh, in everyday practice but I think there are tools that we could be utilizing more of uh, in this space. Anisha, do you wanna follow up on what Claire just said? Yeah, I think that there are definitely 
there's a lot of expertise that needs to be gained in terms of using different diagnostic modalities to, to make the diagnosis, especially something that is accessible and reproducible like ultrasound, right? But um, of course, we're not going to be, I, I do worry about over imaging, right? And the access to all these different types of scans. So I also hesitate on the other side, because if you look for stuff, you find stuff. And so if you PET scan everybody, if you MRI everyone looking for problems, you're going to find a lot of things that maybe would lead to overtreatment. So um, I think, you know, you find subclinical GCA, does that mean that you start treatment? I think that there's just a fine line to walk in terms of imaging modalities. And I think we are just on the cusp of learning a lot more about what that um, what the ideal modalities might be and how we should really be using them in terms of clinical practice. So, so guys, we have a lot of questions right off the bat. We may never get through this. Um, uh, Alvin Wells asked a great question. Does race rule in or out the diagnosis? I'm a strong advocate for this being, you know, a very Caucasian disease. Yes, great cases are seen in other, um, other ethnicities and colors, but um, Anisha, you're nodding uh, no, it does not exclude anyone. Is that right? I, I absolutely think no. I, you know, this is a predominantly Eastern European and, and Caucasian disease, but I have definitely seen many cases of PMR and GCA in non-whites. So I think it, it is, uh, I think that that makes us falsely not, you know, not look or not consider the diagnosis in, in other races. So not knowing a lot of the recent genetic reports on this, we do know that PMR shares this HLA DR beta one uh, um, uh, haplotype with, as you see in RA, which does make it very Caucasian and very Northern European and whatnot, and less likely to be African, for instance. But but there probably are other genotypes then would that would be permissive. I think there's probably other genotypes, and I think there's other factors in in what creates a disease. Uh, outside of just genotype environmental exposures. I think part of underdiagnosis has to do with access to care and, and getting the diagnosis. Um, so I think that there's more outside of genes. And I think, yeah, of course, there's still probably genes that are associated that haven't been discovered. Right. Um, so Anisha, you alluded earlier to some of the um, hazards of relying on the SED rate that it's not always elevated in clear, clear cut cases. How often um, do you need to rely then on, on another biomarker like CRP or IL-6, or, or is there one that's preferred amongst all the ones that are available? Um, so, you know, I think that this is a definitely a point of debate. I think that um, I tend to check both SED rate and C reactive protein at baseline when somebody comes in with clinical features of PMR. Um, there are some people where the CRP will be highly elevated and is more, you know, following their disease course um, and the SED rate stone cold normal. If it's stone cold normal when they first come in, I'm not going to keep checking that test just to see what it's doing. Um, but I do think that there is utility in each of those tests. And it depends really on the patient in terms of what I'm going to use moving forward for monitoring them. Um, and again, you know, Steve mentioned a couple of other features that can be supportive of chronic inflammation. So anemia, thrombocytosis. There are other factors, but um, that can tell you that the disease is maybe more active or, or less active. Uh, but I do look at both of them. So yes, I don't rely solely on a on a SED rate, but I also don't rely solely on a CRP. As with all illnesses, there's a biologic predeterminism, and you get a really good idea over the first few months whether yours is a CRP person or a SED rate person, whether you give them an IL six blocker or not. That will may take away your CRP, but you know. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I like that when patients declare themselves um, like in lupus to be patients who you, in whom you can follow, you know, serologies for activity and some that you just absolutely can't. Um, Leica Barbosa in Dallas said that she did not diagnose PMR in someone who she suspected it in, who had a normal SED rate in CRP. The patient was 90 and she's monitoring the patient going forward. But let's say the patient had symptoms, was old enough, um, was suspicious enough, um, but didn't have the labs, what else would she need um, to make that diagnosis going forward? Anybody want I, to get a jump at that? 
Claire, why don't you? I mean, I think imaging is really where this would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, with that clinical scenario, uh, it sounds a little bit um, un unusual, um, but not impossible um, always. Um, so, I mean, you could certainly resort to sending the patient to have an ultrasound uh, of the key always in this instance, though, is that you're going to need uh, bilateral findings or a combination of findings uh, at one shoulder and one hip to support this diagnosis uh, is, is what I would say. Um, so that's a possibility here. Um, if you were seeing subacromial bur bursitis, bilaterally, biceps tenosynovitis, trochanteric bursitis, that would be very suggestive that you, you've definitely got that, that diagnosis uh, right. Um, so that would be my uh, you know, thinking in that type of a, of a case. Um, obviously, um, there are other imaging modalities that might also be considered like MRI or PET-CT, um, but, you know, a, a simple ultrasound would probably suffice here. These people come to your office, they can't function, they have clinical PMR, you put them on prednisone, and it's like giving spinach to Popeye. The next day, they're fine. And then you follow them carefully, always worried about an underlying malignancy or an infection or some other component of their illness. That's reality. Well, I love that analogy, spinach to Popeye. My goodness, it's so perfect. Um, I once had a 75-year-old man who was a world-class Frisbee dog act. I mean, he... And he went to Cleveland and and couldn't get out of bed and couldn't get out of the tub and didn't get in the competition. And he came to me at PMR, gave him pre the prednisone, and he came back four days later and kissed me on the mouth. And it was like the most embarrassing thing. But, you know, the, I think that spinach to Popeye, that's absolutely true. So I'll ask the hard question. I mean, one, I think the point that Steve makes is these people can't wait around for aisle six levels and for pet scanning and for the, all the great things that you want to do. So you really got to bite the bullet and treat them. And so the question is, is a dramatic response needed for the diagnosis and or is it specific? I mean, everybody responds to steroids. So I won't even ask the question, if they get better on steroids, is that enough? But is that dramatic thing, this Popeye and spinach analogy, is does that have great predictive value? Anybody have real data on that or just gut impressions? Well, uh, I think we know that when they were developing the 2012 classification criteria, they took that out um, is, is the thing. So I don't think we can always rely on steroid responsiveness as proof of a, of a PMR uh, diagnosis. Um, you know, I th it's, it, it is, it's very tricky um, when you're, uh, you know, evaluating a patient who has a typical findings, though, and I see them as quite distinct from the patient that comes in with that classic story, where you really do want to jump in and treat them ASAP, because they're so disabled. Um, whereas the patient that, you know, comes in with the with the slightly unusual history, doesn't have involvement of the hips or something along those lines, um, they, they're the ones that I think you do need to delay a little bit more and, and think about other workup uh, in, in that process. You never stop being their doctor. These patients are two patients. They're patients with an inflammatory disease that responds to steroids, and they're a normal person. They can get everything a normal person can get. And even though you may make a tentative diagnosis of PMR with low acute phase reactants, you want to make sure they have age-appropriate cancer assessments, that they're up to date, that there's no COVID or infection going on. You're a doc. Be right. a doc. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. I want to get into the second question, which is really my concern um, about diagnosis and monitoring, and that is, who's making the diagnosis? Because based on the response here, when I asked 355 uh, rheumatologists worldwide, you know, 60% of you say the rheumatologists make the diagnosis and 38% um, say it's the primary care doctor. 
the, the, the pure numbers here are such that we can't be making the diagnosis on these cases. Um, you may be finalizing a diagnosis. You may be making the diagnoses on those who do get referred, but the epidemiology of this is such that we probably can't see all these patients. There's 5,000 rheumatologists in the United States. There's probably 3,500 to write prescriptions and see consults. Um, and the old data was about 800,000 on a uh, uh, prevalence in the United States. I think the, that number has been cut in half. Do you know the re anybody know the recent numbers on epidemiology in the United States as far as prevalence? I want to say it's like 400,000, 300, 400,000. It's the most recent. The old one, which is fairly well done methodologically, was 811,000. I've often quoted that. But the point is, I don't think that we can. Does anybody have a feeling about who really is diagnosing these? Jack, patients? you on your recent uh, uh, program, you showed that people can't get to rheumatologists. Right. They can get to their primary care doctor. Right. And they're going to make a tentative diagnosis of PMR in the typical situation, put them on steroids, and send them to you three months later if they can get them to you. Right. Absolutely true. Do a, I did a search last uh, about two weeks ago on Twitter looking for rheumatologists who are active on Twitter. And I just put in rheumatology, rheumatologist. Instead, what I got back was a plethora of comments from doctors and patients saying, I can't get anybody into a rheumatologist. Um, my doctor referred me, I can't get in. The wait is till you know November, 2024. Um, it's really, it is a major problem. Uh, and especially in these, what I find interesting about the primary care rheumatologist alliance here in the diagnosis, I think both can make the diagnosis. I think that people, Primary care doctors, all the ones I've interacted with, are think that this is the coolest, keenest, neatest diagnosis that they can come up with. Like they're all kind of jumpy and excited when they call you and say, I think I got a PMR here. I got a live one. Can you help me reel it in? And I don't get that enthusiasm for RA. I don't get that enthusiasm for, you know, I only get that, I get something like that enthusiasm when they tell me it's vasculitis when really it's fibromyalgia. I just want the patient to get into my clinic. But I think there's some, there's a unique opportunity here for education between rooms and primary care and for the appropriate transfer of care. Does anybody have any experience with, uh, Anisha, you run a vasculitis clinic. By having that, do you think that you've created a fast track for these patients? So that's yeah, I think that that's a really important thing. I think that the numbers here are, are very shifted and that a lot of the diagnoses are really being made in, in primary care settings. There's just no way that somebody's coming in for like proximal myalgias to a rheumatologist in any sort of urgent, fast way at this point in time. So I think it's really being made by by the primary care physicians or internists. And then there was a, you know, a task force that we were that we we're, where we're trying to develop guidelines specifically for how to deal with this transition. Oh my God, sorry. I'm so sorry. All right. Um, the, where we're trying to talk about this transition between uh, primary care doctors and how to get patients in to, um, into, uh, into rheumatology clinics. And so there are some fast track clinics that have been developed specifically for this in some European centers. And I think they were a little bit ahead with developing fast track for GCA as well. Um, so there is some experience with that, but I can tell you that, that I don't know any vasculitis center here that has a fast track PMR clinic where patients can get in quickly. And I think part of that excitement that you're talking about from the primary care doctors when they're calling with this live one is because of that dramatic response. And so there's so few diseases where somebody's so debilitated and you give them 15 of prednisone. And honestly, within 24 hours to, to the 72 hours, they they feel fantastic. They feel like you gave them, they feel like Popeye, right? And so I think that's part of that um, excitement, but there is a lot that has to be figured out in terms of how to smooth that transition and, and do, you know, should primary care doctors be starting the steroids up front? How debilitating are the symptoms? How soon will they get in with the rheumatologist? And I think those are all factors that need to be worked out. But even having a vasculitis center, I can tell you it's, it's hard to get a patient in with PMR without having the primary care doctor kind of start the work up and the, the steroids. And they're usually coming to me when they have trouble weaning the steroids. Mm. Claire, do you have such a clinic in, in, uh, in, in Austin? 
Uh, so, so we have a dedicated PMR clinic at our institution, but the system is such in Australia um, that basically you can't access a rheumatologist unless you go through your primary care uh, provider. So that's that's necessary. Um, so in in Australia, the vast majority of patients. Uh, will be referred to us with the, we call them a general practitioner, making that, uh, that diagnosis. Um, and hence, uh, often we don't, I think we probably see the tip of the iceberg, to be honest, uh, in Australia, largely those patients where they're having difficulty making that diagnosis, who bounce into our emergency department, uh, or alternatively, the, the patients who are having extreme difficulty getting off their steroid further down the track. Steve, what's your advice uh, as to how rheumatologists could better improve referral? Yeah, I, obviously, um, if they want to send you a, a chronic low back pain, that's not going to go immediately to the top of your list. But this illness will, because it turns around on a dime, which, as you said before, very few things that we take care of do that. So I think it's the character of the illness does stimulate rapid referrals. Yeah, I think that would help. I also think it would help if rheumatologists were a little more proactive about the patients you want to see. We just assume everyone kind of knows what I'm good at uh, when in fact they don't really understand what you do. Uh, and they don't, that's why they can't manage the patients like you can manage. So um, a long time ago, wanting to get early RA patients, I sent out a note to all my primary care doctors saying, here's a small piece of paper, fill it in, say, this looks like early RA or RA to me, check a box on something abnormal. I'll see the patient as soon as I get this piece of paper, which is gonna have the labs and their notes with it. You'd be shocked at how much that improved referral of early arthritis, not necessarily RA, but early arthritis. I could make a sample short letter that everyone could send to their primary care base. You can get those phone, those addresses from your hospital system uh, and you'd be shocked at, at how many patients you would actually see. So I, I make a pitch for that. Let me, um, since we've talked about diagnosis here, let me sort of fast forward to um, the, the, the criteria that was alluded to by Dr. Owen earlier. And that is this, um, uh, these criteria here, the ULAR ACR cri uh, classification criteria for polymyalgia rheumatica, and it's a point-based system, but to get into the system, you have to be over age 50 with bilateral shoulder aching and an elevated sed rate or CRP, and then you get points. You need four points or more if you're not using ultrasound to clinical diagnosis. You need five points or more if you are using ultrasound as a diagnostic tool, and you can see morning stiffness gets you two points, um, hip involvement gets you a point. Seronegativity gets you two points. Um, no other joints get you a point. And then um, it has the ultrasound findings of uh, subdeltoid or biceps tenosynovitis, uh, um, et cetera. So um, this is, as stated on the very bottom, these criteria are not meant for diagnostic purposes or classification, which are very useful in, in unifying for clinical trials to be done but they do have instructional value in making the diagnosis nonetheless. Um, uh, after these were published, um, I think two years later, a report came out uh, from Ozen, basically where they tested this, showing the sensitivity. And numerous studies looked at the sensitivity. It's basically 90 plus percent, you know, and they showed 90 plus 90 percent sensitiv sensitivity, but specificity that has ranged in other studies from as low as 40 to about as high as this 57. So it's not foolproof from a specificity standpoint. And they were concerned about, uh, it may not be um, good at distinguishing seronegative RA when it comes to shoulder pain and, and that sort of thing. So um, do either of you, uh, any of you use this uh, clinically either or when teaching? I would, I would have to say uh, much more in the research um, setting. I, I don't use this um, in, in my day-to-day -day, uh, clinical practice for, for diagnosis. But I mean, there, as, as you alluded to, there's a lot to be said for some of the elements that are included uh, here in terms of how they help add weight to that diagnosis or detract from it. 
Yeah, the, the part that gets me is the absence of other joint involvement. I mean, I have a lot of PMR patients with, in, you know, peripheral inflammatory arthritis, and that's one of the features that, you know, increases the risk of sort of more severe disease and and sort of a worse phenotype. Um, and I, I just feel like that's not, I mean, I'm not surprising, I guess it's trying to tease it out, right? We're talking about clinical trials and trying to make somebody either have rheumatoid arthritis versus PMR. But I do think that that's one where, you know, I, I'd probably say about a quarter of my patients have some sort of peripheral inflammatory arthritis and they have definite, you know, PMR as well. So okay. that goes, I think, to our next question um, uh, and a few questions about other joints being involved and seropositivity. But the first question is, with a PMR diagnosis, how often do you search for GCA? And two thirds of you say you search for GCA in all your patients. And I'm here to say that, that you're not telling the truth. That, that can't be right. I started getting all worked up and then Dr. Paget corrected me by what, Steve? Well, what does the word search mean? If that means you do a temporal artery ultrasound, a facial artery ultrasound, an axillary ultrasound, that's a whole different thing. But if you ask the questions that are most characteristic of giant cell arteritis, scalp pain, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, et cetera, fever, um, then that to me means searching clinically, which is very powerful. Yeah, I think that, that I think that's the right. I think it's how the audience, in fact, interpreted my question. When I was thinking, I should have asked the question directly. How often do you do imaging in patients who you diagnose with PMR? And and I think that would be a smaller subset. But um, how often should we be doing imaging in someone with newly diagnosed PMR? With newly diagnosed GCA and large vessel vasculitis, that's one of the recommendations. You're newly diagnosed, you should be looking for other large vessel involvement by imaging. Should you be doing that in PMR, Anisha? I personally, I'm very curious to hear other people's opinions on this because I, I do think that there is, we know that there is subclinical GCA with no symptoms whatsoever um, uh, with patients who have PMR and there is evidence of, of large vessel involvement. And, and there's some predictive factors, you know, really high inflammatory markers at baseline, a little bit more in males. I mean, we have some research that's looking into that, but I really, once I see that inflammation on the large vessel, you know, of the large vessels, does that mean that now I'm required to start using high dose glucocorticoids and, and Actemra and all this other stuff? And I, um, I, I would have trouble seeing that imaging lighting up and then not going up on treatment. So for me, I would not want to get like imaging of the large blood vessels at baseline unless, until we really know what to do with that information. If they have clinical PMR, I want to treat them as PMR. And if I have trouble weaning the steroids or, or their inflammatory markers are going up, then I'm going to go searching for maybe some large vessel involvement. Again, with the clinical screening, asking those questions about cranial symptoms, large vessel symptoms. And if I really can't explain rising inflammatory markers in a PMR patient, I know that association and I'll go look for maybe large vessel involvement. But up front, I worry about kind of what to do with the information. And so I would, I personally would not use imaging up front outside of like ultrasound looking for PMR specific findings. I agree, completely with, I agree completely with that. Um, I orbit my patients. They're emailing me every few days. Ten's the worst you could be and zero is no problem. As soon as they get to zero, I'll start to taper them. If they develop any GCA symptomatology, I will image them. But I watch them very carefully. And I don't think anybody has defined the fact that asymptomatic vascular abnormalities mandate that you, you give them 60 milligrams of prednisone. So Claire, you do a lot of imaging as part of your research. Does has that change your day-to-day -day management of the average PMR who comes to see you? It, ha it hasn't changed my day-to-day -day management of the average um, PMR. Um, so we know on, on the PET studies, um, the incidence of, of large vessel GCA can, can be v highly variable uh, in the literature uh, to date. So probably around about the 20% mark uh, or so, but that percentage goes up significantly higher when you're looking at patients who have got 
persistent intractable type PMR symptoms who don't appear to be responding very well to their to their therapies. So uh, in my everyday practice, I would have to say it's very similar to Anisha uh, and, and what Stephen's saying as well, in terms of that I go looking for large vessel giant cell arteritis, uh, in particular, uh, when patients are reducing their steroid and we're seeing uh, elevated inflammatory markers. Um, obviously, if they come in with very profound constitutional symptoms as well, that would be another reason to be concerned uh, about that overlap uh, at the outset. But no, I don't routinely image at baseline uh, for large vessel uh, disease. I, the only other comment I was going to make from a PET perspective is that you know, we have this cutoff uh, that's defined in terms of what is large vessel vasculitis uh, and what is some lower grade uptake. So if you're seeing uh, uptake that's equal to or greater than the liver, then that is universally thought to be consistent with large vessel vasculitis. Uh, but we definitely do not understand what the significance of those lower grade abnormalities are. So I wouldn't be advocating for treating those lower grade abnormalities, but I too would escalate the treatment if I had a patient that had that uh, equal to or greater than liver uptake within their vessels. And remember, we're watching our patients carefully, it's like going to the seashore. The wave pulls away from the shore and you see what's left. They're constantly giving you feedback with regard to new symptoms that may even not even reflect the initial PMR that you diagnose. Have they developed fevers? Do they have headaches now? That's what a rheumatologist is. Yes, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> Paulo Collado asked a question. Um, if the patient has clear asymmetric joint involvement, would that exclude a diagnosis of PMR. So that leads into our two next questions, which look at what else could this be that could be masquerading? The first question says, what does PMR most often masquerade as? And 69% of you said RA, um, with lesser numbers, 12% saying malignancy, 10% uh, saying FUO, and 7% saying infection or sepsis. And then the second question was, let's just say the patient you're seeing who has the right age, right? They're over 60. They have hip and uh, shoulder girdle, um, art, myalgias, arthralgias. Um, does finding a positive RF or CCP rule out the diagnosis of PMR? And only 10% of you said yes. Um, half of you said, no, it does not. Um, and then you're kind of split between, well, if it's a positive serology, with high titers, um, that is a, that that would make me think more RA. Or if it's positive serology with MCP and wrist swelling, that would make me think RA. What does our panel think about this? The, the where rheumatologists are thinking are they are they all spot on as far as considering alternative diagnoses and when they should be playing RA against PMR? This is one of my um, main bugbears, um, is this tendency to often reclassify patients that have developed some peripheral um, synovitis. Um, and I feel like we, we don't do that with other conditions. If you, if you suddenly develop some peripheral arthritis in lupus, we don't say, oh, now you've got seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. Um, if we go to the imaging, there is good evidence that uh, so in our cohort, about 50% of patients have uptake uh, at their peripheral joints when they're scanned at baseline. Uh, and by peripheral joints there, I'm actually referencing wrists and hands. If we're looking at knees, 75% uh, basically. So it's a very frequent manifestation. We do know that there are some subtle differences though in terms of the pathology, so tend to see a lot more tenosynovitis uh, amongst PMR patients than we do necessarily that classic MCP, PIP uh, involvement. So um, in, in, in my practice, for, for me, uh, I don't reclassify these patients as seronegative rheumatoid arthritis if they develop uh, peripheral arthritis, nor do I call them that if that's what they've uh, had as part of their initial presentation, similar to what uh, Anisha was saying. In terms of the serology, 
uh, I'd be very hesitant to call a patient with a strongly positive CCP, though, uh, to be PMR. Uh, certainly have seen patients with low titer rheumatoid factors uh, previously, and that has not dissuaded me from the PMR diagnosis. Steve? Agree completely. Yeah. So yeah. It's, we're not, we, we have no problem with the synovitis. Um, and the peripheral joints. Um, it is the serologies that kind of make us nervous. Well, Does anyone want to define the atypical PMR patient? Um, it's kind of a, a minority of the patients that we might diagnose, but who are they? What do they look like? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different features that, but just to one comment on the last thing. So if somebody has classic clinical features of PMR and for some reason, you know, the RF and CCP were checked even without like, infl like peripheral involvement, a blood test doesn't make a diagnosis like that. And so I think that, you know, especially as people are aging, we have to be aware that there are going to be other serologies that might pop up and, and be floating around, but you know, you're not going to just throw, I don't know, somebody on a DMARD because they happen to have a positive serology and have classic PMR symptoms. But going back to the atypical PMR, which is what you actually asked me about, um, I think there's 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 the presentation part and then there's the response to therapy part. That's kind of what I think about with atypical. Um, so there's atypical clinical features like not bilateral, not having bilateral symptoms, right? We kind of classically think of both shoulders, neck, hip girdle, um, kind of having asymmetric symptoms. Um, and of course, there's the other features with age and inflammatory markers that can make something atypical. So if they have normal inflammatory markers, that's an atypical presentation. But then there's also the response to therapy piece where we kind of really do expect an improvement, a pretty dramatic improvement, of course, depending on where they start with the initiation of, of steroids. Even in the guidelines, they say, you know, within two to four weeks, if they haven't had a clinical response, you really need to go back and rethink about your diagnosis. So I think atypical, there's atypical presentation and then there's atypical response. And so that would be kind of the way I approach it. But what do you guys think? Okay, yeah, and I just I put up on the far right here, basically says everything that was already said about who's atypical and atypical patients should be referred and evaluated by the rheumatologist. That's really the role here. So let's go back to the, the questions. Um, our next question is monitoring. Uh, how do you monitor patients with PMR activity when they're under treatment? And 46% uh, say said rate and CRP, 37% go like gold. And you have, can only choose one here. I know that you know, I frustrated all of you with this question because um, we're going to use a number of things here, but it looks like in priority, said rate CRP, the test is first, symptoms are second. Um, and then morning stiffness, we still seem to like a whole lot um, with very few, maybe 5% or less doing ultrasound. Does the panel agree with this approach in, as a hierarchy to management? I think you always go for symptoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's what a rheumatologist does. Then you might add a sed rate or a CRP to fine tune it a little bit. But you know, you don't, you're not just treating a test. Yeah, uh, certainly. Um... Uh, earlier this week, I was teaching our uh, rheumatology trainees, and um, I said to them that I think it's really key that when you when you reduce the steroid and symptoms start to reemerge, that you take a really good history and do a really good examination uh, to make sure. Uh, you know, often the tendency is to say, "Oh, this is osteoarthritis," or "It's fibromyalgia," uh, but if the patient is giving you a inflammatory sounding history involving sites that have been classically involved at the beginning of their illness, but often to a lesser degree, then I think that that outweighs um, anything else in the clinical assessment. Also PMR patients can get regular things like infections and cancer and all of those things can make your side rate and CRP increase. So I think saying that we're using that as a, as a monitoring tool Sure, I, I totally agree with what Stephen was and Claire were saying. You know, I, you've got to see what the clinical picture is like. If you see those numbers going up and the patient feels fine, what you're not using it to monitor much, you're just checking the test. Yeah, this is a, the pharmacologic um, effect that may precede a therapeutic effect, especially with IL-6 inhibitors and with 20 milligrams of prednisone. So that, that I think that what Dr. Patches says is wise in that 
the symptoms really should be guiding you. But what about the second question here? Um, when you're weaning the steroids, how do you distinguish PMR flare from steroid withdrawal? And I'll, I'll, throw, I'll let Dr. John Tesser confuse us even more. What about on a background of fibromyalgia? Um, uh, where, where can one find certainty? I'm going to ask all of you to give us pearls on how to distinguish flare from steroid withdrawal uh, and then what to do with fibromyalgia. Who wants to go first? And you know, physiologically, we make five milligrams of prednisone at four o'clock every morning for maintenance of our body. So when I start to get from the five milligram or less area, these patients can get steroid withdrawal. It looks exactly like polymyalgia rheumatica. And so at that level, I start thinking about it much more than I certainly do at 10 or 15 milligrams. That's a good, that's a good pearl. I like that. Um, I, I was, go ahead. Yeah, Pearl. I was going to say that I go, I, I go back to the underlying pathology is typically what guides me in this situation. When I've got patients that are describing to me that they've got pain and stiffness around their shoulders, around their hips, and when I'm examining them, they've got restricted range of motion, impingement of the shoulders, tenderness over the trochanteric regions, that to me is consistent with active PMR, you know, irritability of hips, those types of things. Um, whereas with fibromyalgia, to tease that out, I'd be more so looking for that soft, you know, widespread soft tissue uh, tenderness. I think the other good part here is what, you know, what Stephen was saying, by the time you're really worried about steroid withdrawal, like real adrenal insufficiency, you know your patient, you've gotten them from whatever your starting dose was to that five milligram dose. And that's where you're really starting to look for those symptoms that might, or the symptoms of, of steroid withdrawal. And by then you kind of know what their clinical picture, you should, you know, you know what their clinical story is. You know what they look like when they're having worsening disease activity. You know if their inflammatory markers follow their disease activity. So that's when you can start making those changes. And if you know that this person, when they have had worsening symptoms or have a flare of their PMR, their CRP goes up, that can give you a clue. So that's where it really does become a little bit more individualized, I think, at those lower doses below five milligrams of prednisone. And that's where it's important to kind of really know the patient. And of course, there are other symptoms that go along with steroid withdrawal, um, you know, hypotension, nausea, like there's other stuff that will give you clues. Those are not classic symptoms of PMR. So that's where I think you can start teasing out some of the other clinical pictures and also kind of knowing what your patient's personal story is. So, and if I believe they're having steroid withdrawal, I might even get an endocrinologist involved in using cortisone drops in small amounts to try to get them off. Because as you've shown in other programs, one milligram of prednisone can make a difference between osteoporosis and not. Right. Yeah. You know, and uh, towards the fibromyalgia question, my advice on that is there's nothing easy, but the best thing you can do is take fibromyalgia off the table, um, address their sleep problem, uh, address their, their chronic pain with other modalities, address the fibromyalgia in a maximal way so as to not put that as a common denominator that's going to screw you up. And with that, then you can now you can be left to, a, I think, an easier decision between uh, steroid withdrawal and PMR flare. So we have a good question that's kind of a little bit of a converse issue. A patient diagnosed with PMR with elevated set rates and CRPs goes on treatment and is doing well, but they flare. And how do you know it's a flare when their inflammatory markers are normal? Do you have to have a flare that is rubber stamped by a set rate in CRP? No way. Think, there you go. The answer is a, a horizontal movement of the head from all of our panelists. The answer is no. Uh, so you can still flare. And as Dr. Paget said, I'm following the labs. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm following the symptoms to know what else to do. Uh, I'll give you one more uh, question. We're not going to get the questions about dose of steroids or steroid sparing. Um, next week on, on the webinar, we'll be talking about steroids and PMR. And the third week, we'll be talking about uh, treatment and steroid sparing therapy. I think you'll find those sessions really interesting. But um, uh, Dr. Ashraf asked the question, 48-year-old African-American male with shoulder and hip pain and stiffness, uh, bilateral hand pain, swelling, and stiffness, 
very elevated set rate CRP, has a positive um, RF, but a negative CCP, MRI shows erosions. What, where are we going? It sounds like, well, it's just PMR with synovitis. Um, and um, and has, oh, it says, uh, sorry, RF and CCP are negative. So it sounds very much like PMR with synovitis, but there's erosions on MR. Uh, and I guess I always like, uh, my, my comment on this is usually, be careful the questions you ask, because what are you going to do with the results? And, you know, if you did MR, MR of the hands on, on everybody who wasn't a patient in your clinic, you might find erosions there as well. Doesn't mean they're going to get treated for RA. So anyway, what would our panelists uh, do with this? Would you advise them to treat for RA or just treat this as PMR but worry? I was just going to say there's some uh, lovely work that was done by Marco Cimino um, uh, some years ago now looking at the MRI hand findings of um, PMR uh, patients. And ultimately what that demonstrated was that there wasn't a significant difference in the frequency of erosive change uh, between PMR patients and normal controls, which is exactly what you're referencing there. Um, the, the key difference was really uh, the degree of tenosynovitis that was, uh, was visualized. So um, I think it would really depend on what the MRI findings are demonstrating. Uh, in, in those hands. And if you're seeing, uh, it sounded like there was significant swelling in the hands. If you're seeing like a glove-like swelling with tenosynovitis, well, that lends itself probably more to that RS3PE spectrum, uh, which of course is firmly in with, in with PMR. Okay. Um, all right, so we have, a, um, I think we had more questions, but I guess I don't see them. Um, I wanna go get into this issue because it kind of goes along with that last, last scenario. Uh, um, this is a paper, um, Anisha, maybe you want to go over this, but basically it's, it's, uh, the, a study of PMR patients and they looked at a subset who did not have a CRP that was unavailable or not interpretable. And what do they do to monitor those patients? Yeah. I mean, I think the, really the, the question that this was trying to answer, and this was in a subgroup of people that were treated with IL-6 inhibitors. Um, and so, you know, with different changes in therapies, which you guys are going to talk about later, um, it's going to we have to figure out how we want to, want to monitor these patients, right? And so some of the different um, disease activity measures that we use incorporate C-reactive protein, you know, and the same with rheumatoid arthritis, right? There's different measures that you're putting in or different inputs. And, and does that give you a valuable um, picture of what's going on clinically? And can you make treatment decisions based on that? So really this um, was looking at a specific PMR activity score that incorporated C-reactive protein. And we're saying, if you don't have a C-reactive protein, maybe at the time of the visit, or it's not gonna be reliable for liver issues or for the medications that they're on, can you replace that with really a clinical assessment and still um, does that correlate essentially? And or is that still gonna be valuable? And, and in this study, it looked like it was. And so you can do basically a clinical PMR um, assessment tool that is valid. I mean, that's, but if this is a smaller study, it needs to be obviously checked in in larger cohorts, but that's what this was about. So the, the PMRAS and the CLIN PMRAS are, are um, clinical trial tools, and they are, but they do rely on many of the things that we use in practice and symptoms and, and questions we commonly, it's just, they just quantify it. Is that correct? So it has like a patient activity, a patient global assessment, a physician assessment um, in terms of patient pain, physician assessment, um, morning stiffness, I think raising the arms above the head. There are a couple of different clinical parameters that go into that activity score. But one of the things that goes into it is a C-reactive protein. And I think with the CRP activity, PMR activity score, it's like more than 17. It's a very high disease activity. So again, it is a research tool for trying to quantify how severe is your disease. Um, but as we move forward, and if we're going to have more people on therapies that block their IL-6, what, you know, what parameters can we use? And can we just depend on those clinical features to say somebody is either having active or inactive disease? And I think from the discussion that we've had, we obviously all think that clinical parameters are very important in measuring um, a patient's status. Exactly. So um, I think this is just further evidence that even when the CRP might be unreliable, we still can try to make the diagnosis of is the disease active or not. I, I have to ask a question from three experts. We all are going to ask the same, we're all going to do a really good history 
and look for the symptoms to include and exclude the diagnosis. We're all gonna do a joint exam. We're all gonna order a SED rate and CRP. Is there one thing you do in your physical exam assessment that you find really helpful? You know, um, hopscotch, 50 foot walk time, raising your arms over your head, range of, is there one thing that you have found really useful in, uh, in the serial assessment of these patients? Yeah, I, um, I try to assess their strength. And I do that mainly because you have to figure out whether, so, as you try to push somebody's arms down, I ask them, why can I do this? Am I hurting you? Are you weak? Or is it both? Let's try it again. PMR, you can push them down because they hurt. They're not weak. They don't have muscle disease. So that's an important test for me to get a sense of how active their proximal problem is. Yeah, I, I, I was probably going to say um, sort of along similar similar lines um, that restriction of movement at the larger joints, the shoulders and the hips, but also just that observation of the patient as they walk into your room, as they get up from the chair, as they walk over to the bed, um, that, you know, when they've got really active disease, uh, that's a real struggle. That's great. Um, we had this other paper that, um, where is it here? Uh, yeah, biomarkers. You know, the idea is we have SED rate and CRP. Um, there's some hint that maybe CRP is better than SED rate. I don't know if I, I believe that. Um, uh, but this report um, uh, that Dr. Padgett brought to my attention looks at many things that measure our infl inflammation biology, SAA, and other S100 proteins like calprotectin from monocyte, from neutrophils, um, VEGF, angio. Does anybody see a future for any of these in being better biomarkers for the future? Or is there a hope for a better biomarker in the future, Dr. Padgett? I think it's with, with our technology and our chemistry and immunology. I think the answer is yes. And what they did here, which I loved, none of these studies are available to us right now. But some of the studies do show some correlations. But they want to see, can we differentiate GCA from PMR by test, underlying vasculitis, predict relapse or complication, disease activity, monitoring, change therapy. And they have things like IL-6, IL-12, IL-23, as you can see here. I think that's the future of PMR, just like uh, the use of um, radiology, ultrasound. I think it's an important part of the future that we move from 1966, where they used the SED rate, to something that better defines the state of that person's immune and inflammatory process. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, this is uh, the next major frontier, really, for, for PMR, um, is the, the way that we go about monitoring uh, disease and that's for both biomarkers and also for potentially imaging. Um, certainly um, in our group, uh, we've previously noted that there is some uh, significant shifts in just the basic uh, sort of FBE uh, in terms of the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio and also the uh, platelet to lymphocyte ratio, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but in those respects, probably being a bit of a, uh, a surrogate reflection of IL-6 in some in some ways, but um, I'm, I'm excited to see some better biomarkers uh, in the future that can help guide uh, the way we manage these patients. And, and the platelet to neutrophil uh, lymphocyte ratio is like the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. That's all from the CDC, easily available and calculable. So absolutely, know, it's not like you're waiting for some scientific test to come from you know the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Anisha? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that um, we, we need to, we're just at the, I really think we're just at the cusp of really trying to figure out like, what are, the, what's the predictive value of, of some of these imaging findings and what are, you know, like we know IL-6, right? That's, that plays a major role in PMR and GCA and now that's helped lead to therapeutic targets. And so I think as we learn more about the different sort of cytokine profiles, but also not necessarily only send outs to Mayo, but you know, things that, that we can sort of assess and how can we risk stratify, which are the PMR patients that 
you know, in some of the trials, like people, how quickly can we come off of steroids? Are there, is there a group that really doesn't need to be on it for a long time? And I think as we learn about some of these biomarkers and combine that with phenotypic presentation, I think we'll have a lot better idea of how aggressively people need to be treated, whether we really should be looking a lot more for, for concomitant GCA, um, or whether maybe this is a PMR that really could come off of treatment in a, in a couple of months and actually do well. So I think there's a lot to be learned here. And, and I think the biomarkers are gonna be a major part of it. I just don't know the significance of how it's gonna to tie together yet. But I think imaging biomarkers and, and clinical presentation are gonna be used to really drive treatments, hopefully in the future as we learn more about it. I wanna ask one last question of each of you with, and, and because we're, we're out of time, I wanna see if you can do a short answer. Um, can, and I think you can help the audience if you can answer this. How often when making the diagnosis of PMR, will you order ultrasound of the shoulder or hip? And will you do it because you're just interested or because it really adds to the diagnostics, diagnostic certainty? I can never. tell you I haven't been doing that. Never, never initially. Yeah. Anisha. I, I have not ever either. Although I think as I learn more about it, I do think it's important. I don't have the skill set. I'm not going to wait for the report to come back. I'm going to treat the patient, but I, I, I'd like to learn more about it. But no, I've never done it. Claire, I'm relying on you to be the outlier. Please <laughs> yeah. throw us a number. Um, so uh, the answer, sadly, is that I, I don't uh, uh, very frequently do that either. Um, I can scan myself, um, and so uh -huh. there's the possibility of utilising that. But really, um, because of the exceptional access that I have to uh, PET CT, if I'm not not convinced of the diagnosis, I'm not uh, relying on an ultrasound. I'll send them to have uh, uh, a PET. I think it could be really useful, though, if you are well, going back to that fibro question, right, or other trying to rule out other diseases. If you're really in, in a gray zone and trying to tell your patient, this is what's going on, that's where I think the imaging really could be helpful because you're like, listen, there's no synovitis here. There's no tendinosis. This yeah, I, I agree. And and I, I know we're wrapping up. But to that point, the other option is MRI, particularly of the pelvis, to look for peritendinitis bilaterally is, is another uh, really supportive and highly specific finding for PMR. All right. I want to thank our panelists for a vibrant and wonderful discussion that I learned plenty from. I want to thank our audience who was just peppering us with questions all night long, and they were all good questions. And if I didn't get to them, uh, my apologies. Please tune in next week and ask more good questions of our panelists. Next week, we will be discussing steroids and PMR, and Dr. David Liu will be your host. Thank you and good night.